Well, hello to all of you. I'm so glad you've chosen to join us to worship online wherever you are, whether you're local uh, or you're traveling maybe with family and you're just tuning in to keep in touch with us as a church family, or if you live somewhere around the country or even outside of the U.S., if you're tuning in to join us to worship and to dig into his word, we're just glad you're with us because we say at Chapel Street Church, we want to be a place for where you are. Speaking of that, if you're an online w regular worshiper and you've never let us know who you are, we'd love to get to know you. Would you let Pastor Stetson know who you are? We'd love to connect with you and serve you and bless you and pray for you in some way as you track along with us as a church family, even if you do so uh, virtually online. We're in a series called Seven, the Churches of Revelation, looking at these first three chapters, these seven letters to the Church of Revelation. Last week, I said that, um, I asked the question, have you ever seen something or experienced something uh, that changed the way you looked at a person or, or a situation, where you couldn't see this person the same way uh, before, uh, again? Well, I had that experience with my wife. I knew her as a friend in college, and I liked her. I thought she was cute and smart and funny and uh, admired her. But one afternoon on a Sunday uh, at Wheaton College, I was walking out of Traber Dorm, and she was walking down the sidewalk into Traber Dorm, and she was wearing this uh, flowered dress. I still remember it. I used to say it was brown, but she's told me it was green. So anyway, we'll go with what she says. This beautiful green dress. The sun was kind of behind her. It was an afternoon. She was like backlit. It was like right out of a movie, and I was just stunned by her beauty be captivated by her beauty. And we started to date because I did what all brave young men do. I asked her friend to ask her to let her know if she might be interested maybe in going out with me. <laughs> and we started to date. And we got to know each other. And I went and worked at a Christian camp that summer, and she wrote me letters. And I remember pouring over those letters, keeping them in a box under my bunk, reading them every night. And we've been married now almost 28 years, coming up in just a, just a little less than two months. We married 28 years. And a good marriage is not built on feelings of love that you have in a moment, although I still have those feelings uh, for her and I still see her that way. But a good marriage is built on a commitment to love each other over the course of a lifetime. And you know, so it is with our Christian faith. Our, our faith in Jesus, our walk with him, is not built on, based on feelings that we have in a given moment, they come and go, but on a commitment to follow him out of his deep love for us. In fact, Jesus talks about his love for us, his people, the church, in terms of a marriage in the New Testament. He says we're his bride and he's the groom. So I want to talk to you about our first love as followers of Jesus and what it might look like for us to leave our first love and if we do, how to regain it. That's the subject of this letter we're going to examine. Uh, for the next seven weeks, we're going to be in these seven letters to these churches in Revelation. Now, seven is a loaded symbolic number in the book of Revelation. Seven is the number for perfection, wholeness, complete. So these are literal historic churches, but it's also a reference to the complete church, the whole church, anywhere and everywhere throughout history, the full church. The local church is central, not just to the book of Revelation, but throughout the New Testament, to the, what it means to follow Jesus. It, it, and we are never presented with an individualistic or isolated uh, faith, although that's common in our culture today. We, have, we live in a culture where everybody's doing it yourself. DIY spirituality is the flavor of the day. But in the New Testament, the earliest Christians, they understood what it meant to follow Jesus in terms of community, commitment to a local body, a church. Participation in the community of God's people is central to God's will and God's plan for you and for me and for us. That's always been true. Yet I, I frequently hear people say things like this, and perhaps you've said this or heard this. I love Jesus. I just don't like the church very much. I'm just not into organized religion. I mean, I like Jesus a lot. I'm interested in him, but I'm not that, I'm not that down with, uh, with the church today. Here's the problem. Jesus says the church is my bride. Imperfect as she is, he loves her. He's committed to her. So how can you say I love Jesus, but I'm not interested in what he loves most deeply, his bride, his people. Listen to what Eugene Peterson says about this in his commentary on, on Revelation called Reversed Thunder. Here's what he says. We want a Christ who is pure goodness, beauty, and truth. We prefer to worship him under a car uh, the caress of a stunning sunset or with the inspiration of our favorite music. We are warm towards Jesus, but cool towards the church, his bride. It's not irreligion or indifference that keeps many away from the church, but just the opposite. The church is often perceived as and characterized as a carcinogenic pollutant in the air of religion. But to all of this, the gospel says no. Write to the seven churches. We would prefer to skip right from Revelation 1 and the glorious vision of Jesus 
to the victorious end in Revelation 22. But we can't do it. The church has to be negotiated first. The only way to come from Christ to his ultimate victory is through the church. I love what he says there. I believe deeply in what he says there. So we're reading seven letters. We're beginning just with this first letter to churches and to the church and to us as his church in the world. So let's jump in. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, the letter to the church at Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the Nicolaitans, the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Wow. So we're going to see in the, as we go through this series that in each letter to each church, there's a, there's a familiar pattern or structure that's followed. In five of the seven, it's almost identical, the flow and the pattern. It varies slightly on a couple of them. It, it works like this. First, Jesus is uniquely identified for that church. We're in this case, one who holds the seven stars and walks among the seven lampstands. And then the second thing is that they're commended for a certain aspect of their behavior or work or uh, their character. He commends them. He affirms them. Then they're confronted and condemned even at times and challenged for things they're getting wrong. And then they're charged to be different. And lastly, Jesus gives a promise of deliverance if they'll listen to him, if they'll obey him. So Jesus is identified, he affirms them, he confronts them, he charges them, and then he, he promises deliverance to them and to us. So we're going to be watching for that flow as we go. Ephesus is not the first of the seven churches because it's more important or because it's more spiritual uh, or anything like that. It's first for a very, quite frankly, practical reason. Let's look at this map here on the screen. And you're going to see why Ephesus is listed first. Ephesus is first because it's closest. Now, John is on the island of Patmos, right there. And Ephesus is the closest city, right there. That's less than 50 miles. So when John writes these things down, as Jesus tells him to, and he sends the letter to the church, to the churches, this is the first stop the courier would have made. Uh, stopping there in Ephesus, and then it would have been circulated to the other seven churches. Now keep in mind, all of these seven churches are going to hear all of the letter read, so they each hear what he has to say to all of them, but specifically he's addressing each one of them. And we should listen, recognizing that what does he have to say to us as the church in our context in this day, listening to these words. So Ephesus is first because it's closest, and, and Ephesus was a large city, 250,000 people, quarter of a million. doesn't sound that big to us, about the size of Aurora, but it was huge in the ancient world. It'd be like visiting New York City today. It was a wealthy port city, uh, and at its core was pagan temple worship. Now, worship of Caesar, uh, the cult of Caesar was, was institutionalized throughout the Roman Empire, but far predating that, and at the, really this, the economic and spiritual center of the city was the temple of Artemis, or Diana. Artemis worshipped the goddess Diana. That was the center of the city's history and economy and pagan cult practices. The, the temple to Diana, Ar Artemis, was massive, over two football fields long. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. You'll see an image here of the temple. This is all that's left. These two pillars standing in this field are all that's left of the temple of Artemis, which dominated the city for centuries, was the center of its economy and worship. And that's all that's left. In fact, you can see the ruins of several world religions here. On the far hillside there is the Ottoman Turks uh, castle uh, for Muslim empire. You see the pagan worship of Artemis here, a Jewish uh, synagogue in the foreground. All three are there. Now, Ephesus was a seething cauldron of, you know, 
pagan cultic worship. And that's all that's left today. One pillar in a field of rubble. Artemis worship was big business in Ephesus. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, you can read about the Apostle Paul who's preaching the gospel there. That's how the Christianity first came to the city of Ephesus in 52 AD. He's preaching the gospel. People are converted. A small house church uh, movement starts. But, but as he's preaching, people are converted, and they're converted out of something, not just to something. They're converted out of uh, temple idolatry and pagan worship. And so they stop going to the temple of Artemis. They stop buying the little shrines and, and engaging in that, and that's bad for business. And the silversmiths who made the little idols and shrines get really angry and stir up the crowd who start chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You can read that whole story in Acts chapter 19. The point is this, the church that Jesus is addressing, the early church, was born into a world that was anything but Christian, was not at all friendly to the claims of the gospel. And yet it grew, and it remains, while the temple of Artemis is long gone. The church of Ephesus was not a large gathering in one place. It was probably a network of small house churches throughout the city. So imagine groups of 10 to 15 meeting in homes throughout the city, and they're they're sitting down and having this letter read to them in small groups. Let's go back and look at chapter, uh, verse 1 of chapter 2 again. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, every one of these letters is addressed to the angel of the church. So let's discuss that. What does this mean? Who is the angel of the church in Ephesus? Does this mean every church has its own guardian angel? Some have suggested that. Honestly, the truth is that you can read scholars and they all disagree and it's not crystal clear. The word angel in Greek literally means messenger. So probably the best way to understand this, it's an angelic or divine messenger. The best way to understand this is the church, its primary existence and purpose is not just physical or temporal, but it's spiritual. And divine. We have a heavenly message, the message of the gospel, and we have help in heaven with that message. That's probably the best way to understand what he's saying here. Now, notice how Jesus is identified here. The words of him who holds the seven stars and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, you'll remember the lampstands, lampstands, this, this word right here literally refers to the church. That the church is the lampstand in the world, meaning it's a light to the world, a city on a hill, a light that is set for people to see. So when he says Jesus holds in his hand, his right hand, his hand of authority, the, seven, the stars, which are the angels, he holds the spiritual message, message and messengers, and he walks among the churches. It's really a, it's, it's a reference to both his sovereign power and his personal presence. The one who holds all the angels of heaven, all the armies of heaven in his right hand, also walks personally among his people on earth. Isn't that good? Isn't that beautiful? In other words, Jesus is in control of all things, and he's with us. He's present. He's walking among his church. There is no place in the world that you could possibly go where God's people aren't gathered as the church where Jesus is not present. I've been to the jungles of Ecuador, I've been to uh, Samara, Russia, I've been in, in, in Israel and in Africa and all around the world. If you've traveled and seen God's people gathered anywhere in the world at any time, he's there, walking among them, present with them. And if you've heard his praises sung in a language you don't even understand, you can feel his presence. There's no worship song we sing, no sermon uh, that, I, that we preach, no uh, board meeting that we have, no elder decision that gets made, no ministry that we uh, engage in, no activity, mission strip, anything that happens that Jesus does not know about and is not present in the midst of, walking among his churches. This is a really amazing thought. All right, verses 2 and 3. Jesus says, I know your works. I know. I see, I know you, I know what you're up to, I know your works, he says. Whoa, the one who walks among the lampstands, the churches, knows all and sees all. 
He knows everything that we're about, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He sees it. Nothing, no mistake we make, no sin we commit, no uh, way that we as the church get things wrong and, uh, and, uh, and offend each other or hurt one another or fail to live up to the gospel. He sees all that. And he sees all our best efforts as well. He knows it. And so he's going to commend them for some things. Notice what he commends them for. I know your toil, he says, and your patient endurance. This, these two words he's talking about, this is a hard-working church. They work hard for the, gospel, for the sake of the gospel. In fact, the word uh, toil is the Greek word kopos, and it means uh, to labor in the face of opposition or weariness. So laboring hard even in the face of opposition or physical exhaustion or weariness. They're toiling. Patient endurance means, it's the Greek word hupomeno. It means to remain under. Literally, it means to stay under a burden or a load. Like I'm carrying this load and it's getting heavy, but I'm not going to put it down. I'm going to keep striving. So Jesus says, I see your toil. I know you're, 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 you feel weary and the, the load can be heavy, but you stay with it. So what he's saying is, I commend you for being a church that does not give up, that stays the course, that stays with, with the call and the mission. That's a good thing. It's a hardworking church. Maybe, maybe for you, if you've served in a church, uh, or if you're serving currently in a church, maybe at times you're tempted to think, who sees? Who knows? Especially if you serve in a kind of behind-the-scenes role. Maybe you have felt unappreciated or unseen or undervalued at times. Does it encourage you to know that the one who walks among the lampstands is present and knows? He knows your toil. He knows your labor. He knows how hard you work, and he sees, and he loves, and he's commending his church for those things, which sometimes it's tempting to feel like we're forgotten. Does anybody care? Anybody know what I'm doing? The one who matters most does. He knows. And he also commends them for something else, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false, he says. So here's what he's saying. You're hardworking and you're right believing. He's, he's commending them for their doctrinal purity. The, the, the Christians at Ephesus were serious about the truth of God's word. They would not compromise on the truth of God's word. In fact, they, they were discerning. They had a, a way of testing those who claimed to be teachers of the truth, but were actually preaching a false gospel. And they, they wouldn't hear it. They wouldn't stand for it. And it's a good thing, Jesus says. I know that you're hardworking, and I know that you're serious about the truth that you're serious about doctrine and about orthodoxy and it matters to you. And Jesus says, in effect, it matters to him too. He's commending them for them for this. They were spiritually discerning and refused to be led astray by the false teaching in the culture and by that which might creep into the church. In fact, I've been thinking about this, that the temptation is to change the message to be more relevant to the culture. Here's a question. Is it better to be irrelevant than to compromise on truth? I think so. Now, I believe God's message is more relevant today than it ever has been. But I'd rather be seen as irrelevant than compromise on the truth of God's word. And Jesus is saying to these Christians at Ephesus, that's you. You're hardworking, and you don't compromise on the truth. Now, in verse 6, he mentions, you might remember, that you, they hate the Nicolaitans. Well, <laughs> who, does, who are they? What's he talking about? Well, just briefly, uh, we're not... It's crystal clear on this, but the early church father Irenaeus in about the mid -se late second century, mid second century wrote about this saying, these are the followers of a man named Nicholas of Jerusalem who taught a kind of a Christianity, a false Christianity that said, because of the free grace of Jesus, you're free to live however you want. Quite frankly, meaning you're free. It's okay for Christians to engage in the cult worship of, of the goddess Diana and the temple prostitution and practices that went on there. And Jesus says, I hate, this is not, this is not of me. I hate this. And the, so the Christians at Ephesus knew the specifics, even though they might be lost to us. So it's not okay to take part in the, the drift of culture. So basically, Jesus says, right living and right believing, hard working. Think about that for just a minute. Right action or behavior and right belief. Well, what's left? I mean, what, what could be wrong if they're living right and and Believing right. In fact, when people move away from our church, they'll sometimes ask me, Pastor Jeff, do you know any churches in this area that I'm, we're moving to? I want to find a church that's similar to Chapel Street, and, and we want to find a new church home. Can you recommend one? You know what I'm looking for? The 
place where the people aren't squirrely and, and where they, they're not compromised, they're living out the gospel, and they teach the truth. And that's pretty much what he commends the Ephesians for. But the church of Ephesus may be doing a lot of things right. But then comes verse 4 and 5. Then comes verse 4 and 5, which really should make us shudder. Let's read it. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I want you to imagine for a minute you're sitting in one of those little house church gatherings in Ephesus with your family, and their letter is read, and you hear, oh, he walks among us, he's with us. And then you hear the words of, I know you're hardworking, I know how hard you're striving, and I know that you're serious about the truth. And you might be thinking, yeah, he's talking about us. We're doing good. And then you hear, but I have this against you. Whoa. i got to be honest. As a pastor, when I read that, I, I've been pausing this week. It's painful. This is not some email from some fringe, disgruntled person. This is Jesus saying, I have a problem with you. I know you do things right. I know you got some good stuff going on, but I have a problem with you. I honestly, it, I don't want to hear it sometimes. I'd rather focus on the good things. But he's saying, I, I want to talk to you about a problem, and it's not inconsequential. It's a big deal. It's serious. I have a problem with you. I have something against you. What if you uh, walked up to a friend and said, hey, listen, um, you know, I know that we're good friends and I got a lot of good, good history here, but I got something against you. He'd be like, whoa, <laughs> maybe we should talk, right? That's what Jesus is saying to the church. I've got a problem with you, church. Well, what's the problem Jesus has? I mean, he just said that they're right-behaving, hard-working, and right-believing. What's the problem? Here's what he says. You have abandoned the love you had at first. What does that mean? You, some translations say you have left the love you had at first. You've abandoned it. What does that mean? Well, the word first is the word, Greek word protos. It means uh, chief or supreme. So it's the, the, the most important love is what he's saying. What is this love they had at first that they have walked away from or abandoned? Crawford Loritz, uh, in a sermon he preached on this text, said, They had made the process into the destination. The Ephesians loved what they were doing for Jesus more than they loved Jesus himself. I've been meditating on that statement. I think that's really profound. The process, we're serious about doctrine, we're serious about theology, we're serious about the truth, and we are hardworking and we do the hard work, and we're proud of that. That's different than deep humility and gracious love for Jesus himself. It's, there's a difference there. They had loved the process and the, the product rather than the person of Jesus himself. Jesus doesn't say you've lost your love. We think of love that way. You lose it. You fall into it. You fall out of it like it's some sort of accident. Like I was walking along, oops, I fell into love. You're like, that's not how it works, right? Sp biblically speaking, love is not something you, f you trip over and fall into or you accidentally fall out of. And you'll hear this in TV shows and Netflix dramas and on, uh, on social media. Well, we no longer love each other as if it sort of just comes and goes and you can't control it. That is not what love is. Love is a commitment to love someone despite how you feel in a given moment. And Jesus says, you've left that. Not you lost it like, his, you know, where did I put my keys? Or you, it, it just dissipated like, like water through your hands. But you have abandoned. You've walked away. You've left it. You've stopped doing something. You've stopped loving. Let's talk about that. To leave something implies that you, you're going somewhere else. And that can happen in so many ways in our lives. Let's go back to the marriage analogy for just a minute. I think of marriage as like this, this circle at which Christ is the center and the husband and wife, are, are, as they draw closer to each other, they draw closer to Christ. And as they drift apart, they might get closer to the edge of that circle. And, and legally they're still married, right? But they're closer to being out of it than being at the center of it. They, you have to attend to that. You have to work and fight to stay at the center. And we get distracted. 
we get um, deceived, we get complacent, we get comfortable. All these things can lead us to leave or abandon the things we did at first, to stop doing those things. But, but how do you know? How do you know if you're uh, drifting this way? Is it just how you feel in a moment? Because quite honestly, you can come to worship and you can not be loving God or others very well, but come to worship and feel emotional and feel inspired with a song or a sermon. How do you know? Well, actually, Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 39 gives us a very clear indication of what's going on here in Ephesus and in our own hearts. Jesus here is answering the question, what's most important? Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he, Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. This is the first and great commandment. You shall love God with all you are. And the other side of that coin, so the second is not lesser than, it's like part of it. It goes with it you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, love for God cannot be separated from love for neighbor. They belong together. When you try to separate that out, like I'm, I'm loving God because I feel spiritual, but you're just a jerk to people in your life, you're not loving God actually, despite how you feel. Love, your love for God is on display in your love for neighbor. My love for God is on display in my love for neighbor. Ours is. This is what Jesus means when he says, do the works you did at first. Go back and do those things. Jesus puts it this way in John chapter 13, verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. Okay, that's an important phrase. How will the world know that we belong to Jesus? But here's, here's how the world's going to know that you love me, that you're my followers, that you belong to me, my disciples. That's what's wrapped up in that word. Follower, learner, belong to him. If you have perfect doctrine, no, doesn't say that, does it? If you work really hard, doesn't say that. If you always behave right, doesn't say that. If you love one another, if you have love for one another. Now, if you put these things together for just a minute, some of us think, you know, love for neighbor, that means the people outside of the church. And sometimes, for some of us, it's easier to love those who are outside the family of God than those who are inside the family of God. But Jesus says, the primary way the world will know that you belong to me is that you love one another. When the world looks into the church, the way the lampstand shines, it's not just what we say, not just what we do in compassion in the world, but how we treat each other. And it dims the light of Christ and his witness in the world when we hate each other, when we fight against each other, when we divide over uh, secondary issues, when we lack unity and love for one another. Okay, so what is going on then in this, the church in Ephesus? Well, Jesus says, you have abandoned the love you had at first. Love for me, evidenced by your compassion for the world and your treatment of one another. I think that's what he's saying to them. How do you know if you love God? How do you know if you love God? Because you say you do? One of the best indications is your love for your neighbor and your love for his people. Uh, my, my ability to forgive those who have wronged me. My ability to, to pray for, walk with, believe the best about, and want the best for those who I even disagree with, even inside the church. It's hard. It's possible. And I think this happens sometimes in churches that are doctrinally really serious is they get judgmental. Who's the, who's the heretic, right? They can get suspicious of each other instead of loving each other. If we can go back to uh, the, the, the um, verse 5 for a minute. Back one more. There we go. Jesus gives us three things here that in order to how to get back. Okay, so if this is true, if we've abandoned our first love, if we've walked away, if we've left it, how do, how do we recover it? He tells us we are to remember we are to repent, and I would say it this way, we are to redo. <laughs> remember, repent, and redo. Do the works you did at first. First, remember. Remember means call to mind. It means bring back to your mind and rehearse again what? 
the gospel, the central message that you were an enemy of God, that I was hostile and an alien and, 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 and I didn't want anything to do with him, even though I might have si- talked a good game. In my sin, I was an enemy of God, the Bible says. The book of Paul's letter to Ephesians says that. And God in his mercy and grace pursued me, chased me down, loved me, died for me, rose for me, redeemed me, brought me from death to life. Remember, remember, remember. You don't deserve this, it's grace. And then he says, repent. Repent literally means, the word literally means to change your mind and your direction. It, it, it means not just to feel sorrow over the wrong you did, oh, I'm sorry for that, but to change, turn around. So specifically he's saying, you're headed in the wrong direction. Remember the gospel, turn around and go the other way. Head back to Jesus in your loving relationships with your neighbor and with each other. That's what he means by redo. Go back to the basics. Just, to, just this week, I was talking with a man who I'm getting to know, and he asked me a very interesting question over lunch. He said, I'm really trying to grow my faith, but I'm, I'm new to this. I understand my business. I feel like an expert there. I understand uh, uh, these areas of my, of my life, but when it comes to faith, I feel kind of intimidated. He says, could you just give me like three things, three simple things that I could do to start growing in my faith in Jesus? I said, what a great question. And I said, well, yeah. Start reading his word. Start talking to him. And start getting around other believers who will encourage you. And then if you want some more, start serving. I mean, the, the, like the, the, the air and water and sunlight of our spiritual growth, right? We all need it. Get in the word. Develop a prayer life. And get around other believers who will challenge and encourage you. So when, when Jesus addresses the church at Ephesus, he says, remember who, who you are because of my grace. Retell yourself the story of the gospel. Repent of your hard-heartedness and your unloving attitude and go back to the basics. Get back into the word. Get back into prayer. Get back into relationship with other Christians and, and loving and serving one another. I think that's what he's saying to us. Now, Jesus says, if we do this, our light will shine. If we don't, this is terrifying. He says, if you do not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. What is the lampstand again? The lampstand, we're told, is the church. So Jesus is saying, I will remove your church from the church. (laughs) Here's what he's saying. You will cease to be my light and witnesses in the world if you don't remember, repent, and redo. And I'm going to remove my presence from you. There'll be no more light. There'll be no more gospel light in your life. Despite what's on the website or on the church sign, I'll remove it. I'll remove my spirit and my presence from you if you don't repent, remember, repent, and redo these things. I've been thinking about that in my own life and for us as a church and maybe for wherever you are. Jesus says, listen, listen, I know how hard you're working. I know how serious you are about the word, but don't leave your first love. Don't neglect what matters most. In fact, tell yourself the story of the gospel. Repent of your hard-heartedness towards someone that you're unloving toward or unforgiving toward. And then let's go back to the basics. Let's go back again to the basics. You really don't gradu- we really don't graduate from the foot of the cross into some super spirituality. We stay right there, being loved by God and loving others. And if not, Jesus says eventually it's going to cost you dearly. What will it cost us? His very presence. His light, His glory, our witness in the world. That should make you shudder. You know, we're not a perfect church. There are no perfect churches. And the reason is, as we're seeing in this letter and all these letters, is there are people in churches and people are screwed up. We get things wrong. I'm not a perfect pastor or leader. I get things wrong. I make mistakes. Um, I can freely confess that. God knows how many times I've talked to Him about needing his grace to lead well, to shepherd well, to teach well. But above all the mistakes and the things that we struggle with and, and however slowly or imperfectly we grow, what we, what we should never leave or abandon is our first love. That's why if you've been around here, you hear us talk about Jesus and the gospel so frequently because it is the core and the, it is the beginning point, the middle point, and the end point of all that we're about. Who Jesus is and what he's done. 
Now, Jesus closes this letter to the church at Ephesus and to us with a promise. Remember that, that flow, right? He identifies himself, he commends them, he confronts them, he charges them, and then he gives them a promise. Here's the promise in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear. Now, that's a funny phrase. It would be repeated throughout the series. He doesn't mean physical ears. He means spiritual ears. You know you have spiritual eyes and ears? You do. Can you hear in your heart? what he's saying to you and to us. What the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, the word conquers here is it's referring to victory, the victory we have through Christ's death and resurrection. It doesn't mean that we, by our own work, make our own salvation or conquer our own sin. He has done that at the cross. He says, to the one who lives in his victory over sin and death at the cross, he'll give what? The tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If you study the Bible at all, that should, that should be conjuring up some images from an, the first book of the Bible. We're in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and it's referring back to Genesis chapter 1. In the garden, the tree of life, which was present there. Life in Christ. And our access to the tree of life, we're told, is going to be given to those who have faith in the victory of Jesus. Interestingly, the word used for tree in Greek is the same word often used for cross, the wood of the cross. It is by the tree, the cross, that we have access to the tree of life. This is a, a sort of a, th a veiled uh, hint here in Revelation chapter 2 of what's going to become crystal clear as we go. In fact, just if we could skip ahead to the end of Revelation, we read this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. This is the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. In other words, what God is doing in Revelation, in history, is to restore and reclaim that which was lost by sin in Eden. To bring back that which we lost through sin in Genesis chapter 3. He's bringing it back. In fact, this description in Revelation 22 is of the new Jerusalem, the new city, in terms of a garden with a river flowing and the tree of life there. That's our access to the tree of life is through the tree of the cross. So Jesus is saying to this church in Ephesus, you're hardworking, you're serious about doctrine, and I commend you for that. But here's the problem. You've left the very foundation of your faith, your first love, which is the central truth that your only access to life is through me, through what I've done. So rehearse that story over and over again. Repent of your unloving hearts, and let's go back to the basics. If you do that, You'll have victory in your own life and as my witnesses in the world and ultimately speaking, because he's already achieved it, victory over sin and death. That's what it means to have access to the tree of life. You know, there's a, as we close, there's a, there's a legend about the temple of Artemis in Ephesus that the, the goddess in the form of an idol fell from the sky, was a meteor in the, in the early centuries B.C. And the temple was built over that and it fell into a, the, ba the trunk of a tree. So carved into the foundation of the great temple of Artemis was this tree shrine. And there was a practice in the ancient world that crimin condemned criminals or those that were fugitives from the law could seek sanctuary and asylum inside the temple of Artemis. Think about that for just a minute. If you're condemned and you're on the run because you're accused, you can seek safety and asylum in the temple of Artemis at the foundation of which is a tree shrine. I think, perhaps, Jesus is also saying to these Christians in Ephesus, don't be deceived. Those of you who are condemned by your own sin, those of you who are on the run because you, you, you are sinful, there's only one place you can seek refuge. There's only one place you can seek asylum, and it's not in that temple. It's at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the tree of life. That's the place of refuge and forgiveness and freedom and grace. Let's never forget that as a church. We get a lot of things wrong. We've got a lot of warts. The church always has and always will. But let's stay faithful to our first love. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you and we praise you for your gospel. Forgive us for losing sight of it. Forgive us for when we confuse the process for the product. 
when we start to love our own behavior and our own morality and our own uh, commitment to doctrine over you. Lord, help us to reclaim and recover our first love, which is you, Lord Jesus, and you alone. In you alone do we have access to the tree of life, to forgiveness and freedom. Thank you for the great promise that our victory is not in our strength, not in our right behavior or right belief. Our victory is in what you have done at the cross. And we praise you that all of history is headed toward this glorious end with a, new, with a restoration of, of all things. We give you great praise and honor and glory. Lord Jesus, amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. I love how he invited us to remember the gospel, to repent from the, uh, the ways in which we're inconsistent with what we know and to, to get back to the basics, to get back to, to redo the things that we once knew. So if you're anything like me and you felt a little convicted by that and encouraged in ways that you can do something different to grow in your faith, please reach out to me in the comments. I would love to connect with you. I'd love to pray with you and discern how God is inviting you to grow in your relationship with him. But right now, let me bless you and send you out with these words from the book of Philippians. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Bless you, church. Have a great week.